this e afternoon, uh, this message is a little different from what I've been sharing with you. And it is because I believe that um, <coughs> what I've shared so far with you have been stories from the Word of God that I think illustrate what truly the mystery of God is. And uh, I have been trying to make it to you first to present you the stories from the Word of God, so that you now will have a better understanding of what God wants to do in our lifetime. And I do ask that you will try to keep your um, Bibles open, if you have your Bibles. We're going to go through a Bible study, not so much a sermon or a, or a, or a, or a presentation necessarily, um, a talk, but more of a Bible study, because I believe that by the grace of God, you will be blessed with this very important and timely message. Uh, I would like you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Revelation. And I know that it's going to be impossible in the time that I have to truly be able to connect and present this message in its entirety. So I'm going to ask you to um, go along with me but if you have certain questions that you are not fully satisfied in some of the, uh, the at least in the very, very first part, please see me later, I might be able to explain. It's just that it's, it's, it's almost impossible to accomplish the understanding of the book of Revelation, especially chapter 10 that we're gonna talk about in one presentation. But my point tonight is not necessarily understanding what Revelation 10 is necessarily about, it's specifically the mystery of God. Now, uh, in verse 5 of Revelation 10, we have the following text. It says, And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lift up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that are therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there shall be time no longer. Now, so far we see that this mighty angel, this angel of Revelation 10, is telling you something. He puts his hand up and he asks, or he swears, he commands, he gives an a, a important delivery of what he says, and it mentions that there will be time no longer. Now, <clears throat> what exactly does this mean? Not only does it not end here, and, and I want you to make sure that you understand that this message, this angel, actually continues to verse 7. It gives us the timing that he's talking about. When is this time no longer going to, con to, be, to be? Verse 7, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he had declared to his servants the prophets. So here we have this angel, and now some of you who have already studied Revelation can already know who this angel is. Um, like I said, time constraints that will not allow us to go into detail. But this angel, if we go and see uh, verses 10, uh, verses, I'm sorry, 1 through 5, uh, it speaks and describes this angel, and we know that this angel is none other than who? Who can answer this question? of the ones that have already studied Revelation. <laughs> Who is this angel, this mighty angel in Revelation 10, speaking of? Uh, anybody knows? <laughs> I guess not. Wow, that's something that I not did not expect. Uh, yes, sir? Exactly, it is Jesus. Again, if you have, and those that are watching, have not seen the uh, study of Revelation, I do want you to go over and, and study. Uh, there's plenty of resources, but this is not a study of Revelation. I just wanted to make sure we, we keep this in mind. But it is important to understand that Jesus here is giving a command and is telling us that there will be a time when there will be no longer time prophecy. No longer there will be any time prophecy after this particular, particular time. Those that understand a little more of the concept of the little book, it means that the that book of Daniel will be revealed, will be opened, and specifically those 2300 day prophecy will be fulfilled. That is the concept of this angel. That is where this angel comes into play. So we have to understand that when those 2300 days 
ended, the angel says there is no longer any time prophecy. No longer there is something you can actually put time or put a date to. However, what he does say is that when that will happen, the mystery in that around that time, the mystery of God will be finished. And that's where we're going to try to understand today. What is this mystery? And if you have, like I said, been able to study a little more when this 2300 day prophecy ended, you, we know that this prophecy ended in the fall of 1844. So from that time forward, Christ is saying the mystery of God, this is Christ speaking, will be finished. But it specifically points to, and uh, we can see that, to the sound of the seventh, as verse 7 says, to the sound of the seventh angel. Now, who is this seventh angel? And uh, specifically also gives us an assurance that we are in the right time. In uh, Revelation 11, 15, we have what the seventh angel with the seventh trumpet sounds. And we're again, I'm not going to enter into what this seventh trumpet necessarily is. I just want to get the time frame. Again, we're not trying to describe, and I hope that you can get a time to study for yourselves Revelation, but it is a fascinating book, and we're actually going over in the quarterly this year. But um, vaguely, just to understand the time around when the sound when this mystery of God will be finished, it gives us a context of, of when they will start. And so let's briefly just see the context of the seventh trumpet. Verse 15 says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kings of, of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And here it goes on to explain how heaven is rejoicing, because finally, finally, the kingdom of this earth will become the kingdom of, of God. And the reason why that is happening, verse 19 tells us, and the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in, the, in his temple the ark of his testament. Actually, you heard Oscar speaking about that a little bit. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. So the time frame when the mystery of God will be finished, when will, st when will be finished, uh, God tells us it will start when my, uh, the, second op the second compartment of the heavenly sanctuary will be opened. We, of course, know that the second compartment is the most holy place. That's where the Ark of the Covenant, where the Ark of the Testament is located. And this was, as we know through the writings in the, in the past, uh, in the Old Testament, we know from the story of the sanctuary message in the uh, time of Moses that only once a year that second compartment was accessed by the high priest. And we understand that that it was under the Day of Atonement or the Day of Judgment. So we understand and we can see from this description that the mystery of, this, of God will be finished around the Day of Judgment. It will start, it will be sound when the judgment started. Now, if I'm going too fast and you are already, I lost you already, <laughs> uh, please, uh, like I said, try to see me a little later and we'll try to explain more detail how this all comes together. But I just want you to understand that we are seeing when God, when Christ declares the mystery of God will be finished. So I should be starting thinking, okay, if we s believe that this message of the judgment started in 1844 and we understand that the sanctuary in heaven is being cleansed by Christ, the high priest, as Hebrews clearly states, then we have to understand that God is telling us that it is in this time frame that his mystery needs to be finished. Now, we're going to see, by the grace of God, what is this mystery exactly. Now, in the book of Romans, chapter 16, verse 25, we're going to start unveiling what this mystery is. Maybe you have thought it's some sort of unseen circumstance, maybe some unseen, unheard message, maybe it's some secret rapture or some secret thing that has to happen. Well, the Bible does not call it mystery because it's mysterious in nature. That's one of the things that we have to remember. It's mystery because of its essence, and you'll see as we go through the study. In Romans 16, 
Romans 16, 25, it says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the, what? The mystery, right? Which was kept secret since the world began. What is he talking about here? What is Peter, Paul calling a mystery? It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the fact that he was the gospel, the message that came to this world to be preached upon all nations. That is he introducing to us as the concept of the gospel, of what the mystery of God is. Now, also, 1 Timothy 3.16 makes this point even clearer. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on the world, received up in glory. So here he's describing what this mystery of godliness is, what the mystery of God is. It is Jesus Christ made flesh, coming here to die for us, dying in the cross and redeeming us for his uh, kingdom. So, let's go to Colossians 1, 26 and 27. In Colossians, we have this verse that speaks to us. Even the mystery, which has been hid from the ages and from generations, but now is made, made manifest to his saints, to whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So here Paul is not only telling you that it is the gospel of Christ, but that gospel of Christ is not just an intellectual thought. It's not just a message that needs to be preached by you speaking. And it's not just a type of story that you have in your Bible or a book to read. This gospel, this mystery, which is Christ, the gospel of Christ, truly, it's, it's, it's Christ in you. Gospel has to be something that becomes who you are. That is what this is a mystery. How can a fallen human being that has sin in his life, how a person who has for many years been walking in the path of unrighteousness, all of a sudden come to the Lord, realize his message of forgiveness, of righteousness by faith, and then not only that, accepting and receiving him in his life, and Christ becomes part of me to the point that that becomes glory. Now, when you read this verse, I want you to think for a moment. How we have read this verse for many, many years. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto, the, unto all the world for a witness and to all nations, and then shall the end come. So when you think about this verse, most likely we think, oh, I am so happy that the evangelism is going around the world through TV and radio. And so we are preaching the gospel, and therefore I'm sure the end is near. But truly, if we understand what the gospel truly is and what the mystery means, we should actually understand it this way. And the mystery, the gospel of the kingdom, shall be preached in all the world for a witness. In other words, by example, by a living example of Christ in me. That is how the mystery. And so when that is happened, guess what? The end shall come. So that is why the angel in Revelation, Christ himself is telling you, in that time frame, when the mystery is be finished, when the gospel becomes a true experience in the life of my people, I can come. The end is done. There will be no time no longer. There's no need for more time. So, as we have thought over these past few days, presentations, as you have heard, the message deleting, and I shared with you, the first message I mentioned was waiting on the Lord. Now, there's no need to wait, truly, because God is waiting on us. I mean, it's not that God is delaying because he wants to delay. He's just waiting that his mystery, his gospel, he, Christ, can be revealed in each one of us. That is when he'll finish and come. So when we start to think what Christ really wants to do in our lives is to really have him reflected in us. That is why the mystery of God is finished, then the Lord will come. When the, when the mystery of God is finished, then he will come. There's nothing that prevents him anymore. And that's what he 
he proclaimed, he said, there's no, no more prophecy time. There's no more time prophecy. I could come in very short couple of years or maybe months, or it may take longer because my people, those that receive the message, have not understood what I want to do in them. They have not been willing to surrender their lives to really come to the Lord and say, God, please, I want you, Jesus, in my life. Now, why is this so important? Maybe you may say, well, I do have Christ in my heart. And I don't, I don't doubt that all of you here have given their life to the Lord. I don't have that, you know, I don't doubt that. But is truly Christ living in us? What does Paul mention that says, Galatians 12, 20? I am what? Crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, giving your life to the Lord, if you truly want to know what that means, is to say, Lord, I want to be crucified with you. I want to die to self. I want to die to me, to who I am. That is truly accepting Christ in your life. Paul speaks of that. I am crucified. I no longer live. It is Christ living in me. That is Christ in me, the hope of glory. Now, what was the desire of Christ? In John 17, 22, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one even as we are one. You see, the reason why Christ needs us to be given totally to him, to surrender ourselves to him and to have Christ in us is because he knows that it is impossible for us collectively to be one if he is not in our lives. It's impossible. People talk about unity in the church, unity among God's people, but it will never happen unless first Christ lives in our hearts, unless we have surrendered ourselves completely to the Lord. Because unity only can happen when Christ is living in me. But talking about unity, and I've heard messages and, and, and texts and uh, articles about unity and seeking unity, but is it truly that what we should be emphasizing ourselves in? I think that we'll make a mistake trying to receive unity when we are not connected first with the source, which is God, Christ. So Christ in you, the hope of glory, or when we receive his glory, we are one with God. And, for, and in that process, as we're one with God, we can be one with one another. We first need to uni unite to Christ, come close to the Lord before we can have unity one to another. John 17, 1. You may say, well, that hope of glory, what does that mean? What is the glory of God? What is that, 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 that unity that the Lord wants to have in his people? These words sp spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes in heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy son, that thy son may glorify thee. You see, Christ and the Father had that unity, that unity where each one of them wanted to glorify the other. Now, what is this glorifying, this glory that he's talking about? Well, let's go to what the Word of God tells us in Exodus 33, 18 and 19. You know this story, Moses was asking the Lord, and look what he says, and he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Moses wanted to know the glory of God. He was like you perhaps asking, well, what is that glory that you want me to, to have? What is the glory that, that I can receive, that I want to see? So he says, I want to see your glory. He may be thinking in terms of, I don't know, just honor or, or majesty. But the way the res Lord responds is, is very simple. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. And I will, pr I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. 
And of course, in, in verses 5 and 6 of chapter 34, he says, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed be by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sins, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children, and to the third and to the fourth generation. Here is God, the Christ, proclaiming the name of God. It is proclaiming his attributes, his character. It is telling Moses, Moses, <clears throat> my glory is my name, is my character. And that is the type of glory that I want you to have. This is the glory that Christ, when he came, showed to the world. The Jewish people had misunderstood the character of God. They thought that he was a mean, vengeative God. They had put the idea in the minds of people that God will come and punish you if you were not good enough. And if you had a son or daughter who had some sort of illness, that was a punishment of God. So they had taken the, the character of God and just smeared it all in the wrong way. Christ came to rectify that. And by example, by dying on the cross, by showing his absolute love for us, made it perfectly clear what type of character God had. I mean, from the very beginning, way in heaven, Lucifer attacked the character of God. And that was his, his way to get people to, I mean, the angels first, to dis be deceived. He accused God of being arbitrary, to just want and demand glory to himself and, and, and praise to himself. He did not, he mis 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 saw the character of God and twisted his character and destroyed who he was before many people and, of course, in this earth. But Christ came to rectify that and to make us clearly understand what his character is. That character that is merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, and pardon transgressions and sins. Yet also reminding us that part of that love, it also brings a time where he will have to allow sin to be purged from existence. So we understand these concepts. Why is it now that we don't seem to grasp the concept that God is trying to fill, fulfill his mystery in us today? Ephesians 1, 9 and 10 tells us, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he had purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might be gathered together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him. So do we, are we seeing what Christ really wants to do in, in the mystery? He's trying to unite, unite the sinful man, unite the transgressor to the Father, the perfect the pure, the holy. And the way to do that is Christ in us. The way he can do that to be able to restore the sinner, us, in, an, in our fallen nature, to be able to stand before the Father in perfect unity is Christ in us. And for us to be able to connect and have true unity among our brethren, which is really the way it can be truly seen if we are connected with Christ is when we have unity among God's people. That is really the way it's going to work. You remember the story yesterday I spoke with you about Judah. Judah was a man, as you remember, who had none of that. He was uh, selfish. He was a betrayer. He was ready to incite his brethren into uh, rebellion in a way, and he went and, se and seeked for all the things in the world. But when he truly came back to the Lord and repented of, him, of his sins, how do I know Judah was truly repented? It's because he loved his brethren. 
he was willing to take their their spot. If they were gonna be killed, he was willing to be the one that to take the, the you know be be killed. He he was willing to take their place. That is how Judah became a true representation of the glory of God. And that is why the Lord said, Judah, you know, you are the right, the right leader. You need to be, from you, I'm going to have my uh, seed. M- my, my son will go through your, through your heritage. So we understand, and, 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 and for us to, to marvel or to think about how this unity among God's people is going to come, I think that we're just trying to force what is not truly there. God wants us to just be connected with Christ truly. That way, everything else will come into play. For he, Hebrews 2.11 tells us, for he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one. Jesus who sanctify us is, and they, us, his people, who are sanctified by Christ, they are all what? Of one. Oneness. Being united. Being able to be in one accord. We saw that in the disciples at the time when, when, when the great Pentecost came upon them. They were in one accord. They were united. And that same experience will and must happen at the very end when the judgment begins. That is when the mystery who has been being fulfilled throughout the ages in many different people, who were able to connect themselves to God and, and in result connect with their one another and be in one accord, the same thing has to happen at the very end of time. And that is when Christ will come. And that's why he's not ashamed to call them brethren. He's not ashamed to call us his brethren because we are one with him. You know, I don't, I have, I'm thankful to the Lord that I have not had to call, uh, be ashamed of my brethren, or my, my, in my house, for example, my siblings. Thankfully, I don't have to worry uh, about being ashamed of what they do or what they, they, they might uh, be said about. I feel that I've been blessed in the sense that we have been raised under the instructions of the Lord. But, you know, if you imagine if you had a, fr- a brother or a sister, maybe you have that experience, that you're ashamed of. And you're ashamed not because you don't love them. You're not ashamed because you stop caring for them. You're ashamed because of what they do, how they live their lives, how they treat their families, how they treat their parents, how they may act. And so, or they may have brought shame to your family. Maybe they're not in a good place. Maybe they are in a correct place. I, I, I don't know. It, it just, you know, you have to think of yourself like maybe I know what it means to be ashamed. And Christ telling you, I'm not ashamed of my brethren because we are one. We're sanctified. I am, I am sanctifying them. And by them becoming sanctified, they are one with me. That is why I'm not, a, I'm not ashamed to call them brethren. And in Matthew 12, 50, Christ told you, who are my brethren? Who are those that I consider my family? For whoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Those that do what? The will of the Father. This is really something that we of ourselves can never do. But sadly, today we hear far too often messages and, 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 a, and a gospel that saddens my heart because it's not biblical. It's not from the word of God. It's the gospel that tells you that it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what type of life it, you choose, what your actions do, what you do in your inner life or hidden, whatever, as long as you believe in God or in Christ, you are saved. And I know that it is, sounds good, but it's a false gospel. It's not the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ is a gospel of power, of enabling us to have Christ in me, to be able to get rid of all that holds me to the earth. 
that separates me from my father. That is why he's saying, Christ in you, that's the hope of glory. That's the reason what, how the gospel is going to be preached. By testimony, by people seeing Christ reflected, his character in you and me. Gospel, Christ in you, unity to one another. First Thessalonians 4, verse 3. What does it say there? For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. So you may think, well, the will of God is to be sanctified. God tells me that, Jesus tells me that my, my brethren, my sister, my brother, my mother, my father, are those, my, my kinsmen, are those that do the will of God. And the will of God, in the word of God, is his sanctification. Is that process of purifying me or refining me, of uniting me, a sinner, to a state of Christ and being able to be united with the Father. So what it means to be sanctified, how do I end, how do I earn, or not earn, that's the wrong word, how, I, how am I sanctified? How am I in that process of sanctification? Well, clearly, John 17, 17 tells us this very simple concept. Sanctify them through what? Thy truth. Thy word is truth. So it is the word of God as I listen to the word of God, as I spend time seeking the Lord and learn, getting to know who he is, how I become sanctified? And the answer is simply yes. That is how it is. It's not a process of myself. It's not something I can obtain. And it's not just knowledge, intellectual knowledge of the word of God. Is the key here is truth. Truth is what the Holy Spirit inspires to understand. He, speaking of the Comforter, the Lord Christ said, He will guide you into all, all truth. So when you open the Word of God, if you don't ask for this leading of the Holy Spirit, you might be deceived reading the Scriptures. You might come to conclusions that are really unbiblical. But when you seek humbly and say, Lord, I recognize I need you, and I need the Holy Spirit to be able to guide me into truth. Then he comes into my life and starts cleansing me in a sanctifying way where I start living those things that are earthly and more and more imitating what the atmosphere of heaven is like. Ephesians 5.31 tells us of a concept, of a mystery. Now this mystery that happens, uh, and, and Paul, I don't know if he had a sense of humor, I think, when, I mean, I think he had in a, in a way, um, but let's read what he says here. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be one, what? Flesh. This is a great mystery. He's saying, Perhaps he was not married, and I, I believe that he might not have been married. Um, but he's saying, this is a great mystery. I understand the concept, I just don't know in my own experience. But I speak as concerning the Christ and the church. He's saying, I'm using this illustration of a husband and a wife to illustrate how Christ and his church are united, are one flesh, are one thing. But honestly, I, I, he probably says, I think it's a mystery because I might not see that many in the true uh, experiences of marriages. And you know, it, I just have to tell you this story because it's, it's really, it opened my eyes in a way, um, in some way. Last year, um, sorry, December 2017, my grandfather, uh, he lives, or he lived in Ecuador, in, in Quito, which is the capital city. Um, and so my grandfather, he was 91 years old, and um, since around May of that year, he was uh, diagnosed with uh, cancer. Uh, of course, 91 years old, it's a little, um, there's not much to do. The doctor said there's really not much to do. And of course, we have, my mother has always been a faithful uh, person who believes a lot more in, in, in natural path, in the sense of uh, trying first uh, a way to do it with, a, you know, with simple remedies and things of that nature. So uh, she, you know, she was trying, and, and I believe that the Lord blessed her with, you know, giving him a lot of 
juices and a lot of things and, you know, and, and a lot of treatments that he really didn't have any suffering, praise the Lord. But, you know, when we, when we found out about his tumor, um, he, the doctor said that he only had, I mean, uh, 10% or less than 10% of, 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 of um, in his colon that was working. Nine, I mean, 90% it was already uh, cancerous. So there was really no way that the, he could really live in much longer. Of course, when I talked with him, I remember in May, because I went first in May to talk with him, it was a blessing for me to talk, and, and he was, you know, he's, he was a very strong man. I mean, he, most people did not believe he was 91. I mean, he will, he's in his full, um, um, you know, uh, powers. He had no need to be carried anywhere. He will, you know, he lived by himself. He was a widower since age 32. So from that forward, point forward, he never married anyone, and he, but he lived by himself, and he was able to take care of himself. And so he raised my mother and my, my aunts, two, three girls. Uh, so imagine, it was hard, but uh, he was a faithful uh, man. And so I, I'm really thankful that he had accepted the Lord a few years before, too. So when I talked to him about, you know, being ready, uh, you know, he, he said, he was like, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I, I have lived long enough. I believe that, you know, I have no need to be around any longer. So we, we, you know, we prayed and he continued with his life, uh, but by December, we knew that maybe his days were coming to an end. Uh, I had seen him in May, and of course by, by December, he already was in his final days. So with that in mind, um, uh, I received um, uh, a great news from my brother, my older brother. I have an older brother who is uh, three years older, so he's 43 right now. And for 40 two years, 41 and a half, he had been single. So there's hope for those that are still looking for spouse. So after 41 years, uh, you know, I honestly thought he might be just called to be like Paul. But he, um, he was praying for the Lord for a wife, and so um, he told me the good news that, well, he had met someone, and, you know, we already knew about it, but in December he t or November he says, uh, brother, I'm, I'm, mar I'm marrying... Maritza, I'm marrying her in December. And he told me the date. I, I really forgot now. I, I think it's the 14 or 12 or something like that. Um, I'm sorry, 16. That's what it is, 16. Now I remember, the 16th. Anyway, um, he says, I want you to be the pastor that marries us. So I said, oh, wow, that's a, that's a first. What a blessing. So I, I really was excited and happy that my brother was getting married. I mean, imagine, you know, I, I got married 12, uh, 11 years before him, so I've always tr was trying to encourage him, saying, you know, brother, marriage is a blessing, and, you know, I I'm happy, and so he knew, but it was just the not right time, I suppose. Well, to try to get to what I'm trying to go with this story is that when I, um, I knew that this was going to be an interesting trip, and my wife and I knew, and our children knew, that most likely we could have a wedding, but also a possible funeral. I mean, it was just like that. So when we arrived to the Ecuador, to Quito, the airport, you know, we arrived, and we go to the immigration officer. I, um, I come to him, and, and he asks me, you know, what's the purpose of your visit? Like anyone who go goes overseas is asked. So I tell him, well, uh, we're here, and I'm coming for a wedding. But as I'm saying we're coming for a wedding, my wife starts to say, we're coming for a funeral. <laughs> so we say wedding and funeral at the same time. So he's like, like, you know, uh, like, what? So I said, no, no, we're coming for a wedding. My wife says, no, no, we're coming for a funeral, most likely. And, she's, and he's like, oh, I get it. Yeah, they're the same thing. Yeah, I was like, no, 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 we're truly coming for a wedding, and we are, you know, there's like a possibility my grandfather might die, is in a funeral. He's like, no, 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 I know. Funeral, weddings are funerals. I mean, that's, that, that, that's it. You, you says you, the time you die, you marry, you time, this is when you die. So, you know, I mean, that was just an interesting thought, but truly, it seems like today, that's what it is. Most marriages, I mean, and sadly, even those in the Christian homes are that, funerals. There's no love, there is no harmony, and the reason why is because most of us who have married, 
have forgotten that the key ingredient is Christ. But if Christ was living in me, if Christ was living in you, if Christ is living in my wife, if Christ is living in, in me, that marriage would be a blissful experience. It will be the experience of having that unity, that unity that God wants to have with his people, that unity that God wants to have with us. We could be able to say by experience, I know what it means to have Christ in my heart because I can see it in my wife. I can see her connected with the Lord and through her, I see the love of God towards me. And she could say the same thing about me. I can see the love of Christ. I can see that it is true. The gospel is a power of salvation. I can see that my husband is no longer a selfish man. He's no longer a childish boy or man, but he's truly Christ in him. He loves me because he loves the Lord. And that is what today the majority of our homes is not united because there's no longer Christ in us. And that's why Paul, I, I believe, also says that is a mystery. It is a mystery. It should be. It should be a reality. It should happen. But sadly, it's, to many, it's still a mystery. They don't understand. They don't, cannot comprehend. And then we expect to have unity in the church, unity in our families. It's just impossible. But the Lord, in his power and his grace, is telling you, I if you surrender, if you come to me, you can be transformed. You can have the power of God in your life. Ephesians 5, 26, 25, 26 tells us, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse Cleanse, cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. Do we understand how he again connects cleansiness, being one with his word, with the power of his word? We do we understand that there is not just a concept, an idea thrown out there, but it's actually a true experience that he's offering to us that we can, by the grace of God, by his mercy, we can be transformed to the glory of God. A friend of mine I have met has been for many years asking and preaching wonderful concepts. And he has mentioned things like, I want to see people in the church working together in, 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 in their own farms, but having a, a, a one singular economy so that the church can sustain the poor and the needy and, and be, you know, one again. He brings lessons from the Old Testament and from the New Testament in regards to that Jewish economy or the way that we can have equi equity among us trying to push the concept of unity, of unity, of unity, of unity with one another, unity with God. But one of the things that I can sadly say about him is that he had, or he has, the, the issue, the problem that I believe all of us can or probably have. And that is that when in a meeting, whether it's a board meeting or a gathering, when there are ideas given for projects, for some way we can be more effective in the community, for more effective with our families, more effective with our uh, mission to help those that are in need, when his ideas are not accepted, he takes the, the, the way where he leaves everything and says, well, I am not going to support anybody else. I don't know if you have had that experience with in your churches or in your communities or in your own families. When you are thinking or preaching about unity or trying to talk about being together in your family, but truly you're not willing to see to yourself, 
you're easier to point someone else, but not too easy to, not to see yourself. You know, it, it is so sad for me to see how in that particular family, I've, and I've talk, tried to talk to him many times, approached him as far as reaching to him and sh telling him, look, I value your opinion. I'm glad that you have a different point of view, but if, if it's not accepted, don't take it personal. Don't take it, you know, like it's like they rejected the voice of God. It's, it's your idea. Come to the Lord. Realize that you need, and I think that's the biggest thing that most, most a lot of, of Christians uh, today have is that they don't realize that they are still full of self. We're still somehow full of selfishness. We're not willing to surrender. We're not really willing to, to come and cleanse ourselves from our own. And I just do not understand why for us it's such a hard experience coming to the Lord truly and surrendering. I just don't understand. I wish I could because the, sim the simplicity of the gospel is very plain and clear. But it is us, our selfish heart, that prevents this mystery from being f finished and fulfilled. I mean, I'm thinking, isn't the Lord waiting for us? I mean, God is waiting for his people. He wants to finish this, this, this mystery and be able to come. If his people were to really reflect his character, if his people were really united with him and then be united to one another, the job would be done. The work will be done. The gospel of the kingdom, the mystery of God, will be preached to all the world. You couldn't contain such gospel because it's a life, it's, it's an evidence, it's a testimony, it's a living experience. You couldn't contain it. It couldn't be just done through preaching to television and to uh, radio programs. It will be through thousands of people who live that gospel. Of course, the end will come to all around the world. You will travel to India. You will travel for holiday to, I don't know, Europe. And everywhere you go, it's a living example of the character of God. Merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and in, and in truth. I mean, I, I'm just saying, have you thought about that? What really the difference it will be to the people and to the world? That's why the, the, in Revelation 18, it talks about an angel that highlights with the glory the earth. That is talking about God's people. Not, not some sort of, individual pastor or preacher but it's about God's end time people who have reflected his character in such a way that the world is lighted with the glory the glory of God there is one final reason why this mystery has to be finished it has to be finished here on this earth see the gospel of Christ Christ in you united you to one another you are united with Christ, you can be united with one another. And that, when you are united with one another, then you can have unity with the Father. Have you read this verse? I'm sure you have. 1 Thessalonians 15, 51. This is how the mystery of God ends. We understand what it is now, but this is how it finally ends. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but shall we all be what? Changed. We shall all be changed. Now you're thinking, oh, thankfully, that means that I will change my habits and my selfish being and all of that at Christ's coming. That is not what it means. If you think that way, you are going to be bitterly disappointed. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but shall be all changed in a moment. In a twinkling of the eye, at the last trump, that is speaking and connecting to when Christ himself will descend with the glory of his Father and the angels of, in heaven. He's talking that, that re the reason why that mystery and how it ends is that we will, once we have Christ in us, once we are connected, united with Christ, and Christ is living in me, that hope of glory, and the character of Christ is in me, I am connected with my fellow men. I am connected with those that are around me. We're united. We're one thing with Christ. And then we can receive that final part of the mystery of God, which is changed. That, what? 
that, uh, in that trump, in that last sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and shall will be changed. And it, it speaks of this corruptible will be covered in uncorruptible. That is when you'll receive immortality. When Christ comes, the mystery will be complete. You know, it will be done. You will be able to stand before the Father. But it's the external that is changed. It's that flesh that is changed, but it's not the character. The character has already been changed, has already been molded to the likeness of the Father, has already been molded to the likeness of the Christ, has already reflected His glory. That is why when Christ shall come and will come, He will come for His people, His family, His kinsmen, those that belong with Him, those that have been united with Him while on this earth. There is a cloud of witnesses throughout history. There's a cloud of witnesses who have been looking by faith to the time of the end, who have been looking by faith to this final period of Earth's history, looking attentively, and it speaks in Hebrews about this concept that we have a great cloud of witnesses who are watching and being waiting, and if they could somehow see that you and I are hindering by not surrendering to the Lord, by not allowing his character to be revealed in my life, that we're hindering the end of all evil, what do you think they will say? Will they tell you, go on, keep going, keep doing what you want, keep allowing self to reign in your heart, Keep doing your own pleasures. Continue in your own sinful path. Continue to believe that somehow God is going to transform and change you at the very end. That right before Christ comes, you're going to stop wanting to hurt another person. You're going to stop wanting to lie and cheat and steal. You're going to stop wanting to be involved in secular things like sports and entertainment and all of that. Somehow you're going to change and God's going to change you so m at the very end so quickly that you're going to be such a different person that in heaven where there's none of that, there's no competition, there's no killing, there's no eating, no, 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 I mean there's eating but not like killing something to eat. Uh, where, you know, there is none of that. You're going to somehow be happy. Is that even possible? Doesn't even make sense. It doesn't make any sense. And that is why we have to understand that if they were to see us, if they were to look at us, and they'd be like, why? Why don't you just give up of yourself to the Lord? Why don't you surrender yourself to Him? It is simple. We have done it. The apostles were able to do. We have seen in the, in the stories of the, in the Old Testament, we've seen it is possible for human beings, even if they're filthy, they are corrupted, they have been done hideous crimes, even if they have been murderers, rapists, whatever you're going to call them, the power of God to transform those lives and for them to be able to have victory over that of their sins, it's enough evidence that you and I can indeed do the same. And I believe that if we ask the Lord, Lord, I want to be one of your people. I want to be one of those that you call your brother, your sister, your father or mother. I want to be part of your family. I believe with all my heart that he will come. He will come when he will see us in that way. And if we are not taking our part today, if we're not surrendering ourselves to the Lord, if we for somehow we're not willing to do that, Sadly, others will. You might not, but the promise is that there will be a group of people, that there will be a number, there will be enough that will give honor to the Lord by having his character revealed to the world. And that will be the day that Christ will come. Don't worry about a date thinking that there's got to be somehow I have to find out a day so that I can get ready. If you do that, 
you're most likely not going to be ready. The concept is very simple in the Word of God, and it's very clear. Today is the day. Today is the time that you have. It's a chance the Lord has given you to commit yourself to the Lord, to surrender to His will, and be part of that faithful group of people who will be waiting for His Creator, lifting his, their arms up and saying, Behold, here's our Savior. We have waited for Him, and He has saved us. May the Lord allow us to truly surrender ourselves to you, to him, and we may be that mystery revealed to the world. And that mystery can be finished before it's too late, before the chance is closed for many of us. God gives us that assurance of salvation and has given us the concept that we have a privilege above all privileges. We live in that very last period of time of the history of earth. I don't know about you, my beloved brother and sister, but I do want to be redeemed. I want to be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. I want to be sanctified. I want to have Christ in me. I don't want to be any more David Salazar. No. I want to have Christ in me, the hope of glory. That we people may be able to see, may see Christ and not me. But that is something that I and I alone can choose. And you have to choose that for yourself. No one else can force you. Not even God can force that upon you. So may you choose today who you will serve.